We would like to start, start, start our talk by taking you back 3.8 billion years ago, when the world was a very different place. Temperatures were near boiling point, noxious gases filled the atmosphere, and the only oxygen available was bound up in hydrogen and minerals upon the Earth's surface. However, in this extremely hostile environment, a series of small tidal pools emerged, containing nothing more than a dilute solution of organic compounds and salts. And it's within these pools that the first signs of life appeared, in the form of primitive, single-cell microorganisms, bacteria. Today, the swarms of bacteria found within these volcanic pools have evolved into over one million different species of life. This ranges from algae to butterflies, uh, elephants to giant oaks, and even to us humans. We're all connected to a chain that began 3.8 billion years ago. However, in this extremely, due to our interference with the Earth's atmosphere, all of these one million species and over 3.8 billion years evolution are currently under threat. At the moment, we're pumping a massive 36 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere each year. Now, if we continue doing this, this is going to result in the highest atmospheric carbon emissions in more than 50 million years. The consequences of this will be devastating. And the, the problem is that... Um, uh, it's almost these unprecedented levels are really going to lead to sort of a series of events that occur. Um, it really send a whole series of disasters that happen from this. Um, we're really talking about a huge number of deaths. It's not going to be in the millions, it's going to be in the billions. It's a really, really serious issue that we're facing going forward. And I think what Alexa and I did is we read a whole plethora of climate change books, um, a huge range of them, and we were really excited about doing something about it afterwards. They very eloquently described the problem of climate change, but none of them had a solution. And we went searching around and we were looking for the solution, but we just couldn't find one. And it's really out of this that Zero Fifty was born. What we wanted to do is create a solution for climate change and say to people, well, this is how you can resolve the problem, so you have this choice. So Zero Fifty, essentially, it tells you how to make the world zero carbon by 2050. And it does this without affecting our modern lifestyle. Now, it's designed to look like a magazine as well. So the issues are presented in a very attractive, innovative, engaging way. So we can look at it in a different way to what we normally do. But first, in order to understand how to make the world zero carbon, we have to understand what our competition is. And the competition is coal, gas, oil, and nuclear. Um, electricity for, uh, derived from coal, for example, is 10 cents per kilowatt hours. And gas, 6.7 cents. Nuclear, 10.8 cents. Um, now, that's to make that a little bit more clear, um, I've got a prop um, uh, incandescent light bulb here, <laughs> um, ten, ten, uh, 100 watts. To uh, power this uh, incandescent light bulb for 10 hours with coal, that would cost you 10 cents. Um, with gas, it would cost you 6.7, and nuclear, of course, 10.8. But that's all about you know money. How about carbon dioxide? Well. Um, Powering this light bulb for 10 hours with coal would uh, emit half a kilo of carbon dioxide. And half a kilo of carbon dioxide would fill 200 of these bottles, and that's just 10 hours. Paints a picture of how much damage it can actually do and how much emissions actually can provide. So what we're looking at here is, is really what we wanted to look at the best alternative available, and we believe it's renewable energy sources. So we looked at every renewable device out there, spent a long time studying it, looked at how much they cost, how much land they take up, uh, how reliable they are, and will they work on a global scale? Now, today we want to talk about cost. Oops, some of our things have moved around a bit, but that's OK. Um, on the far left, you can see a big variety, because we start about 8.7 cents for onshore wind, and then we're going up to something like 51 cents for, um, for wave energy. But what we're looking at here is ones that can actually compete with fossil fuels. So we wipe off all the costly ones to the ones which are in the price range. So we've got about five there. But at the moment as well, what we can also do is look at the ones which actually we can implement on a global scale. For example, large hydro is pretty cheap, but we've also already used up much of the resources. So 
Other technologies are still developing and their prices are still coming down, but at the moment, directly today, we see it as being directly competitive with fossil fuels. We've got onshore wind, we've got PV panels, and we've got solar CSP. To be able to compare this to fossil fuels, um, we have compared gas, for example, to wind. And gas is 6.7 cents per kilowatt hours. Wind is 8.7, just 2 cents more. Then you've got coal and solar PVs. And as you can see, they're exactly the same at 10 cents per kilowatt hours. And I mean, which one would you choose for a renewable future? And then we can compare nuclear at 10.8 cents and then solar C, um, CSP at 12 cents per kilowatt hours. I think what makes this really interesting, though, is the way the different things are going. Now, we all know coal, gas, oil, they're all finite sources. Their prices continue to rise because there's less of them and they're harder to get to. In contrast, renewable prices are going down. And the more we invest in them, the quicker the prices will go down. At the moment, they're on parity. Yeah? But as it moves forward, there's opportunity that renewables will go down and these prices will continue to go up. Our future is renewable fuels. That's the way we go. The more we invest in it, the cheaper they become. So that really should be our priority moving forward for a more economical and prosperous society. But generating energy is one thing. Generating energy for a whole planet is a completely different thing. At the moment, we've got 6.9 billion people on the planet. And together, we're consuming 144 million gigawatt hours of energy. Now, to try and put that into some kind of perspective, that works out 86 billion barrels of oil as an equivalent. And if you were to put all of those barrels of oil next to each other, they will cover the entirety of Belgium. The problem doesn't stop there, though. Our population is increasing very rapidly. And by 2050, we're expecting to have 9.2 billion people. Um, what this means is that by 2050, the, um, what our energy use will be 276 million gigawatt hours. By saying this, if we continue to consume energy in the same way, it means what we'll have to do is build an energy infrastructure which is renewable to support twice the amount of energy we start currently consume today. So it's a huge and huge undertaking. I mean, we did some initial figures, and that works out about 15 to 16 million large-scale wind turbines. If we covered that out, obviously they have to be separated a distance apart, but that means you would cover all of the cropland in the world to actually provide this. It would be a huge, massive undertaking. But how much is all this going to cost? Now, if we use the cheapest solution, which is onshore wind, we are looking at a figure of around $290 trillion to actually power the world. Um, that's enough money to buy Facebook 3,000 times. So really what we're trying to say is it's, if we're going to continue using energy in this way, it's just, it's just too much. you know. What we've got to do is actually reduce down the amount of energy we consume so we can actually build up a renewable energy structure to support it. We simply can't build this amount of stuff. We don't have the finances, we don't have the land, we don't have the resources to build on this particular scale. So we've got to drop the energy level down. But don't panic. You don't have to throw away your laptop yet or live in this cave. Um, all we have to do initially is to design products that we use every day in a very um, energy efficient way. Our text has gone a bit crazy again. <laughs> but um, this graph is essentially saying that 87% of our energy use is used within three sectors. And those three sectors are buildings, transport and industry. Um, within what we're doing, we really specialise in these different sectors. So we assess how we can reduce down energy with each of those to quite an extent. We will be reducing the amount of energy in the building sector by 73%. And this we will do by first integrating super insulation in buildings, uh, maximising daylight in buildings, um, increasing uh, the use of really good uh, innovative uh, technologies for lighting and also forcing manufacturers to create products that are really energy efficient. I think it's just important to highlight just how much opportunity there is to reduce this energy down. With transport, we reckon we can reduce it down by 70%. Now we're going to be doing this by essentially looking at the way we plan our cities. We're going to be doing this by maximising the opportunities from public transport. We're going to be proposing more clean and efficient targets and options for fueling. And we're also looking to reduce down the number of short-haul flights that people are taking by offering better opportunities for that as well. And we will be also reducing energy as much as possible in the industry sector. 
and we'll be doing this by overhauling, uh, re uh, recycling, uh, integrating uh, the circular economy. Um, also, we will be also um, uh, integrating the most cutting edge technology into our manufacturing processes. Now, we know that's a lot of big talk, and we don't really have time to sort of present all of these ideas today. So what we wanted to do is focus in on one particular idea to give you some of the idea of the potential that's available to actually reduce down the amount of energy we consume. Now, this little table here, it shows in the centre what our cities used to be as a size, four kilometres. And that's essentially because we were limited by our legs. We had to walk everywhere to go and do something. As things move forward, cities went out and they've expanded. This is because of the invention of the train and the automobile. And now cities can expand for up to 80 kilometres. The problem is we can't go anywhere without a car. Um, if you want to go and have a cup of coffee, you have to take the car. If you want to pick up your kids at school, you have to take the car. If you get sick and you have to go to the doctor, you've got to take the car. There's absolutely no way around it. You have to have a car. What we introduced is the concept of a six-minute city, where you can walk everywhere you want to go within six minutes. Now, the principle of this works is it can be applied to either an existing city or a new city. Um, and really just to talk you through how it actually works, Alex is going to explain a bit more. So, step one, you have to create an area of 8.8 .8 hectares, um, within which everywhere you can walk within six minutes. Then step two, you set up your basic infrastructure. And this would be a bus stop or a tram, and this connects you to all the other communities around you. Then step three, you add all the key uh, facilities, such as the media center, uh, the clinic, post office, and uh, you know, a beautiful garden. Step four, you add a few shops to um, integrate the commercial aspect and bring in money into the community. And then step five, you start adding people. And in order to make uh, the six minute city really viable, what you have to do is increase the density of the city by about 250 dwellings per hectare. And then step six, let you know, sit down and watch the city grow. Basically, if you want to go and get a cup of coffee, that's six minutes. If you want to go to the doctor, that's six minutes. If you want to go and see your friend at the coffee shop, um, that's six minutes. So, you know, this is everywhere you go, everything six minutes at your fingertips. So what would the six minute city look like? Well, it would look like some of the most beautiful parts of some of the most beautiful cities in the world. All of these cities kind of work on that principle within those locations. In Paris, the streets are much pedestrianised. You can walk, you find cafes, you find bars, you find all the doctor's surgeries, and people desire to live in those different places. So this is really the way we need to live, is in high density, enjoyable places to be in. Um, to really demonstrate the potential this offers, we've produced up this graph. Uh, if you look up in the top left-hand corner, you can see Houston. And this shows Houston, which has a density of about 25 inhabitants per hectare. And on the left-hand side, you can see it's consuming 80 gigajoules of energy. Now, down on the bottom right, you'll see Hong Kong. Density is up at 300. Now, in comparison, it's just on about 5 to 10 gigajoules worth of energy. It's almost 1 20th of the energy that city is using because it's denser and everybody's got the things closer together. They can walk to the different places. And you can see it's a pattern that emerges as density gets bigger, we essentially reduce down the amount of energy required quite substantially. Within 050, we are going to reduce our energy use from 276 million gigawatt hours in 2050 to 75 million gigawatt hours. But um, how much is this really going to cost? Um, to make the world, uh, uh, to power the rest of the, this, this renewable energy, we will have to kind of find 80 trillion dollars and of course that might sound a lot like a lot of money to you um, but if you think that per, per person that's about eight thousand five hundred dollars so over a 35 year period you could actually for eight hundred uh, eight thousand five hundred dollars actually create a completely renewable world or infrastructure yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so we wanted to try and give a visualization of what this would look like so we've generated this idea of an urban generator. What this does is it combines the idea of building together, both with a renewable device. I mean, now we're not sort of pumping fumes out of the side of our power stations. We can actually relocate them into the city and start to take advantage of some of the built elements we have as well. 
Um, in this, we've got a few of them, but in this talk we want to talk about the wind tower in particular. The wind tower is composed of two parts. The base is the accommodation. So this is your apartments, your offices, maybe even the school or hospital. And then the other part is the renewable energy um, device. And here you can stack um, wind, wind uh, <coughs> uh, ver uh, <laughs> they're called he um, vertical, vertical axis, axis turbines. turbines. And what they do is that they take advantage of the shape of the tower plus the height of the tower to harness as much energy uh, through wind as possible. Essentially, the higher up you go, the more the wind blows. So you can get more advantage from the wind energy the higher up it is. So that's why it's really stacked up and uses that verticality as an advantage. So what we wanted to do is then, using these as a device, is insert them into cities and start to create a vision of what our world could look like. So this would be lower London uh, with lower energy demand, sorry. And then, but using that, we've then integrated in the wind towers to then provide the renewable energy to it as well. So this is our future vision for London, zero carbon, zero pollution. And this is our vision for Tokyo in 2050, zero carbon and also zero pollution. This is Sydney, again, zero carbon, zero pollution. And Shanghai, 2050, also zero carbon, zero pollution. So really, in summary, I think what we're doing here today is we're not doing it a traditional TED talk in some respects because we're not here presenting one idea. We're here presenting a multitude of ideas that all combine together to create one vision. And this one vision is of a, a society which is removed from the threat of climate change. But not only that, it's taken advantage of this and it's used it to create a world that's got less pollution. Um, by that means we live longer, healthier, happier lives. We've got buildings which we enjoy being in more because they're more comfortable and more natural light, much more benefits in there. We've set up our transport infrastructure so we can access all the facilities we need within a few minutes. We don't have to sort of trawl around everywhere and drive massive distances anymore. It removes time, you know, we save time, which we use so much these days. Um, as well as that, we're also a more united as a whole world moving forward. We've all got a vision that we're striving for. So it gives us that opportunity too. And I think, um, I mean, really, climate change has been described as the biggest threat that mankind has ever had. And we don't really see it that way. Uh, we kind of see it as the biggest opportunity we've had as well. I mean, this is a real opportunity that we can use to really create a much better planet for all of us. Um, so that's it. Hope you enjoyed our talk. Thank, Thank you very you much. Very much.